Hello, I'm Dr. Horazin Kitano of Focus Applied Technologies. Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the difference between inertia and loading type chassis dynamometers. We get a lot of questions on this. We produce both types of dynos, and so I was going to explain a little bit about what an inertia dyno is and how it works. So, um, chassis dynamometers, you have a vehicle, and the vehicle is driven onto the rollers of the dynamometer. Uh, the vehicle wheel spins up the uh, roller and you measure its acceleration to calculate the power force torque of the vehicle. In this case, let's look at a uh, motorcycle, a motorcycle type dynamometer. Uh, we'll look at uh, a typical motorbike like a, a CBR 650, something like that. The vehicle is essentially acting as a point mass with the radius of the rear wheel. In the case of the CBR uh, 100, maybe together with the, the rider, we're going to have a total mass of about uh, 280 kilos. The radius of the rear wheel is going to be about 0 0.3, 0 0.31 meters. Um, another important factor is the radius of the roller of the dynamometer. In this case, they're usually about one foot, and so the radius is going to be about uh, about 15 centimeters, or 0.155 meters. Okay. Now, if we look at the inertia, the effective inertia of the vehicle running on this dyno, it's going to look like a point mass at this radius. The inertia of a point mass, the equation for that is inertia of a point is equal to mr squared. Okay, if we're looking at um, the 280 kilo vehicle, then we're going to have uh, inertia of a bike is equal to 280 times 0.31 squared, which is going to give us a number of about 27. Okay, the effective inertia of the motorcycle is about 27. Now let's look at the roller. The equation for a roller, because it's a cylinder, not a point mass, is different. So if we look at a cylinder, or the roller, the equation for that is one half mr squared. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the mass isn't all acting at this radius r. Most of the mass is, is less than that. Therefore, the inertia of a roller has to be less than the inertia of a, a point mass. Okay, now, as we mentioned, uh, usually these are going to be about one foot diameter, so we've got the, inert, the, the radius. Uh, the weight of them, typically the weight of the rollers used in motorcycle chassis dynamometers of this type is on the order of 280 kilos. So, let's look at that. If we say the inertia of the roller is equal to one half the mass, which is 280, times 0.155 squared, we're going to wind up with a total uh, inertia of the roller, of the dynamometer, of about uh, 3.4 kilo meters squared. Okay, but well, there's a problem. Um, we're trying to simulate the, the load, the road load of a, of a vehicle where the inertia, the effective inertia of the vehicle is 27 with a roller whose uh, effective inertia is 3.4. Uh, it's not quite as bad as that. We also have another factor called the gear ratio. Now remember, this wheel is bigger than the roller, and so the roller is going to spin approximately twice the speed of the wheel. That's good because the effective inertia, the inertia of the roller at the wheel, goes to the gear ratio squared. So, we'll say that our gear ratio, that is the, the difference in diameters or radiuses of the wheel and the roller, is approximately two. And so the effective inertia of the dyno acting on the vehicle goes to the gear ratio squared. So he's gonna be 3.4 times two squared. Two squared is four. Um, so this is gonna give us a number of about 13.5 kilo uh, meter squared. Okay, well, we still see that we're trying to simulate a vehicle with an effective inertia of 27 on a dyno with an effective inertia of 13.5. Clearly, when we accelerate, it's not going to have enough inertia to hold the bike back. In fact, if we look at the velocity as a function of time, when we're spinning up on the dynamometer, uh, we spin up on the road, we'll get this nice, slow spin-up profile, something like that. When we spin up on this particular dynamometer, what we're gonna see is we spin up twice as fast. So this is the dyno, and this is the road. 
So you really can't use a dynamometer like this for simulating how your vehicle is going to perform on the road. You're going to accelerate with twice the acceleration you'd expect to see. Uh, what a lot of people think is they say, oh, well, I need a, a more massive roller. Let me go for a heavier and heavier roller. Honestly, that's not the way to go. Um, let's look at an example. This is a shaft from a small dynamometer, and it weighs about 300 grams. Here's a disc. It also weighs about 300 grams, but you'll see the inertia is very different. This guy, I can spin up with my fingers very easily. It'll spin up very quickly, almost instantaneously, and it'll go to a very high speed with very little effort. As soon as I put the disc on there, though, we have a very different uh, thing. This is a much larger rate. It's about 10 times larger. So the inertia on this guy is going to be uh, about 100 times larger. So when I try to spin this thing up, you can see I can spin it, but I can't spin it up. I can't spin it up anywhere near as quickly as I can the shaft. So just going for a heavier and heavier uh, roller is not the way to go. What you really like to do is maybe go with a smaller diameter roller to increase your gear ratio and then on the end of that roller place a disc and that's going to give you a lot of inertia. And in fact in the inertia dynos that we produce that's exactly how we do it. We depend on the gear ratio and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, gear ratio in the, uh, in the roller to rear wheel. That way we can get um, a road load and a dyno that match up nicely. The next section, we're going to discuss how loading type dynamometers work. Stay tuned for that. Right now, we're going to talk a little bit more about chassis dynamometers. Specifically, we're going to look at loading dynamometers. And in this case, we're going to be looking at eddy current loading type dynamometers. There's a lot of different retarders you can use, water brakes and other things. But the most common for chassis dynamometers is to use an air-cooled eddy current type dynamometer. Now, how do eddy current dynos work? Well, actually, um, I know you guys are all uh, experts in electromagnetic theory, so you understand that if you have a magnetic field, a uh, moving magnetic field in a conductor, that you will induce currents inside that conductor. They're called eddy currents, and that's basically how generators and electric motors work. Um, this is a nice simple demonstration. In this case, I have an aluminum plate and a magnet. A lot of people think I'm cheating and they say this is a steel plate. It's not, it's aluminum. And so the magnet will not stick to it and it's, it's not sticky or anything like that. It's just a conductive aluminum plate. When I release the magnet, it's gonna fall due to gravity. Well, of course, we're gonna have relative motion between the magnet and the aluminum plate. And so what that's gonna do is it's gonna induce currents in this, in this plate, this conductive plate. And so what you'll see is the magnet falls very, very slowly. Why? because the currents induced in here give a magnetic field which resists the motion of the magnetic field of the, uh, of the magnet. Okay, well this is a very simple eddy current dynamometer resisting the motion of the magnet. How do we use this in a chassis type dynamometer? Well, instead of moving the magnet, uh, what we do is we move the conductor. So in a vehicle type dynamometer, chassis dynamometer, what we're going to see is we'll put the vehicle's wheels onto a shaft and that shaft will spin a disc. Now, it's not so convenient to use a permanent magnet, so what we're going to do is we'll take a coil, an electromagnet, a solenoid, and we'll run some current through that. When we run the current through it, we'll get a magnetic field, and if we put that magnetic field in proximity with the disc, when we try to spin the disc, we'll resist the motion of the disc. Now, it winds up being a very handy system, very convenient, very simple to run, for a couple of reasons. One, the, uh, the magnetic field is proportional to the current. So if you look at your magnetic field, usually we use that symbol, we say, you know, until let's say it's proportional to the current. Um, we'll also see that the torque or the resistance of the device is going to be proportional to the magnetic field. So our torque is going to be proportional to the magnetic field, which is proportional to the current. That's nice because it gives us a very linear device. Uh, if we look at how is the torque as a function of speed, in this case maybe RPM of the vehicle, what we'll see is we're going to have, this is our torque, this is the RPM. So maybe at 100% load, we'd have a torque curve that would look something like this. Uh, your torque can increase or be flat or decrease depending on some specifics of the design of the dyno. And usually what we would do is we would target to have a peak torque right in our normal engine operating RPM or vehicle operating speeds. So this is at 100% current. If we want half of that, we 
we can say, okay, there's 50% current, here's 25% current, 75% current. And so we can come up with any combination of speed and torque that we want. Additionally, what we want to do is we want to know what is our vehicle's torque curve. And so we're going to have a vehicle torque curve somewhere in here. And with this, we know that at 100% torque, we will always have more torque than the vehicle can put out. And that will allow us to test to stall or test any point in the vehicle's uh, operating curve that we want. Okay, so that's, that's very briefly how loading type eddy current dynamometers work. Um, for the next part, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do some testing in the lab and we'll do some runs that are just inertia versus heavily loaded. Stay tuned for that. Here's a partially disassembled dynamometer. You can see on the inside, we have the rotors and the coils. If it pan back, you'll notice that the, uh, the rollers themselves are relatively small diameter and we have an advantageous gear ratio here. So the discs spin at a fairly high speed, giving it higher inertia and more torque. Okay, we're now looking at the software interface for the dynamometer. We have a motorcycle loaded up on the chassis dyno and we're gonna do two pulls. The first pull, we're gonna do ex um, inertia only. So I've just shut off the power to the retarder and what we'll see is when we do the pull, it'll take about nine seconds. The second pull we'll do with the loading prescribed here and you'll see that the second pull takes significantly longer, about 16 seconds. You should also notice that when we do the loaded pull, the results will be a little bit higher and they'll be a little bit more accurate because we lose less inertia, we lose less acceleration um, to the, the torque to the acceleration of the inertia of the engine. Okay, it's gonna get a little bit loud. So this is the first pull with no load. seconds and it's giving us a peak torque, a peak engine torque of about 67 newton meters. This is the dyno's torque down here and it's not zero because we have some friction. So we actually measure the friction of the dyno and the other components. So uh, the difference between these two is the acceleration of the inertia. Now I'm going to go back and we'll repeat exactly the same pull only and now I'll turn the dyno current on. You'll notice in the time counter over here it takes significantly longer. So here's the second pull with loading on. You'll also see the, the dyno torque shows up here, much higher. gave us a slightly higher torque. The difference between these two curves here is essentially the acceleration which was lost to the acceleration of the engine and the running gear, the torque that was lost to that. So <clears throat> this first component down here, this is the torque that was absorbed by the retarder. The difference between the blue line and the brown line, that is the torque which was gathered from the acceleration of the dyno's inertia. And then the difference between these two blue lines, that's the torque that was lost to accelerating the engine's inertia and the, the vehicle's running gear. <clears throat> so you can see during the pull, you'll get fairly similar results from an inertia type and a loading type dyno. But what you should see if everything's tuned properly, the loading type dyno is going to give you slightly more torque because we've lost less during the acceleration of the, the engine and various components. Of course, there's a lot of other differences between loading and inertia type dynos. Loading type dynos, you can maintain a constant load for tuning and other things like that, whereas an inertia, load, uh, inertia type dyno, you can't. So hopefully from this, you can see the difference between the inertia and loading type dynos and uh, the ramifications towards accuracy. Slightly better accuracy and slightly higher numbers are what you're going to expect to see from a loading type dyno. Thanks, and log on to our website for more information.